Well, yeah, we okay. you're used to it. <laughs> you're live now. Mm -hmm. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Kamla Patney. Um, I'm a founder and chair of a project called um, Celebrate Our Similarities, uh, as you can see behind me, our banners. Um, I feel very honored to be able to, uh, well, being asked to uh, interview uh, Professor Raghu Raghavan, and I'm very pleased to be able to, um, um, you know, Hold this event for the Man of Utsa um, session on the 11th of uh, July during the South Asian Heritage uh, Month. So, if I, I'll just start off uh, with um, just a, a little resume about Professor Raghu Raghavan's um, clinical background. Um, his clinical background is in health psychology and nursing, with expertise in participatory research and co-production. His research is encapsulated by four overarching but interrelated themes which address issues in mental health, disability, and well being. And they are improving access to services and interventions, user involvement, practice and service development, and cultural diversity and inclusion. His current research consists of exploring the conceptualization of dementia in minority ethnic communities, faith, belief systems, and mental health recovery, mental health literacy, and research participation from diverse ethnic communities. He has published widely in disability, ethnicity, and service improvement. He is currently editing a book on mental health, ethnicity, and cultural diversity exploring narratives for transformative services. He is director of the Mary Seacole Research Center and is also coordinating the International Transcultural Mental Health Network. So thank you, uh, Professor Raghavan, um, and um, thank you for joining me. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, go straight into the questions. So how have you been? Over the last uh, couple of months, and um, you know, tell us tell us a bit about your um, experiences. Have you had any um, sort of positives and challenges that you've faced? Yeah, thank you, Kamla. Thank you for um, asking me to join this program. It's a great pleasure to be part of the program. So, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, um, obviously, um, over the last. Um, two or three months, I should say, uh, it's been all working from home. Really. So for us, it's been in, in, in contained in one room, maybe in, in terms of work-wise, and, and, and expanding in the evenings and other places to the whole family. So it's been, um, in a way, it's, it's, it's challenging, uh, but I always work from home a few days a week. So obviously, uh, for me, that doesn't actually make any kind of difference. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it is a challenge because you're not actually meeting many other people. You're actually talking to everybody through Zoom or Microsoft Teams, the virtual meetings. And I think after a while, you tend to actually have withdrawal symptoms from that. Um, so I think that, that's, the, that's the challenge. But it's been enjoyable because I didn't have to drive to Leicester. Um, so obviously it takes um, for about an hour or so for me to get to Leicester. So obviously I didn't have to drive so I could straight away, you know, get changed and go to the study and start working. So there we are, uh, and then make over the family as well. So the whole family is also here. So that's an opportunity for us to be together uh, for, for the last two or three months. So that's, that's, yeah, so it's a challenge uh, in terms of the work styles and the, and the family life, well, everybody. Yeah. Mm, that's true. Um, the positive is that we get to spend more time and a more relaxed uh, working environment in, on the one hand, but we are losing the human touch in the last yes. few months, which yes. is quite sad, yes. Um, uh, so can you, so, so uh, just moving on, how would you define good mental health then? 
Brian, mental health is, is a very broad term. Um, everybody talks about mental health. Um, but when we talk about mental health, and I think everybody talks about mental illness, but I will come to that in a minute, because um, there are so many terms here, mental health, mental illness, uh, mental distress, um, psychological well-being, and all those terms, they all more or less mean the same thing. But mental health, I think, is one of the most uh, misinterpreted word, I think, because you're talk you should be talking about health um, as opposed to the psychological, you know, in terms of the psychological health, as opposed to mental illness. So when I ask mm -hmm. students both in the UK and also students in India, um, that when you talk about what is mental health, they all come up with uh, a definition of mental illness. But I said that is not what mental health is all about. Mm -hmm. Mental health is all about how we are able to function ourselves in a most stable, appropriate manner. Uh, in terms of our positive thinking, um, self-awareness, uh, and our ability, because obviously life is always going to be, the, there's going to be the stress and strain. Just because you're mentally healthy does not actually mean that stress and strain and anxiety and other things, that doesn't actually affect you. It does actually affect more. So obviously it is our ability to try and, you know, get through those um, stress and strain and pain in our life in the most appropriate way possible, because there is no uh, one uh, cookbook approach here as to can, how you can stretch mental health. If everybody has got their own ways of actually dealing with that, so it's how one travels or takes that journey through all the stress and strain and pain in life, in, in creating that that positivity in life, in creating the resilience is another one, in, in resilience of that. Uh, how we are actually able to um, uh, you know, move away from the negativity and think about the positive things and creating about the self-awareness so that we are actually able to see our own stress and strain and try and seek appropriate ways of actually um, you know, expressing that and also seeking help if it actually becomes a distress context. So it's a matter of degree, I think. We all actually experience um, you know, psychological imbalances of, uh, or, or and we all actually experience um, anxiety and depression, uh, but it's the degree that actually matters um, in terms of how it becomes a, a healthy option or, or an illness option. Mm. Um, I mean, today's discussion is about uh, building resilience uh, within the, well, with a particular attention to the South Asian uh, community. Um, but also, whilst you were talking, I, I, I just recalled a conversation that we just had recently about the project that we're doing. Um, and we had a bit of a Freudian slip, and we said mental wealth uh, instead of yeah. mental health. And then we started talking about it, and it just feels so appropriate that actually mental wealth, you can develop your own wealth from within. It's almost like your mental muscle to be able to be resilient as well, you know. So yeah. uh, it's yeah. it's quite a quite, – I, I so agree with what you just said there, and uh, pleased to hear that. So um, – so what, how would you say, define, sorry. Six, six. We often say about there is no health without mental health. That it seems to be the slogan everywhere. Mm. So that means to say that, uh, you know, I mean, you've got to be mentally healthy uh, for with everything in, you know, to actually even combat the physical illness and physical uh, problems, etc. So mm. you've got to be stable enough to try and understand what is actually happening to us. So I think we've got to be thinking about our mental health as, as, as the primary aspect of our life. But that is not actually the way how people look at it um, mm -hmm. in the context, not just in the UK, globally, that is the mm -hmm. case. And I suppose it's very relevant at this point when, uh, you know, we've got the uh, pandemic as well to be mentally strong as much as you can be as well. So uh, that's... Uh, that's a topical issue right now. Yeah. Um, so, so how would you describe uh, what what is mental ill health then? Uh, mental ill health, obviously, is uh, when you actually experience the distress um, in terms of the stress and the strain, and that uh, you're not actually able to cope with that anymore. There are two times that are in two two kind of stages. I think uh, there is the distress. We all actually experience distress at certain times in terms of anxiety. We feel very anxious about things. We feel quite down about things. Um, and that is quite natural um, to actually experience that distress. 
Um, but um, so the, the healthy context comes in in terms of you're actually able to talk about it and then you're able to try and resolve some of those issues through within your family or friends or other people. And you might not necessarily need to actually go in to seek professional help for some of those. But mm -hmm. well, the, the, when you, if you just ignore the distress context of it, then it, uh, then it actually becomes um, more of a, a problem and an issue, and it uh, affects your thinking, your behavior, uh, your family life, uh, your work context, and everything like that. So then that passes when we actually get into the kind of realm of illness mode. When by, well, by you're not actually caring for yourself, you're not self-aware as to what you're actually trying to do, and everything seems to be a problem. Everything seems to be quite stressful for you, and you're not able to actually function um, as you used to function um, in, in life. Um, and so I think that's the stage of mental illness, as we said. Mm -hmm. and also, as I said at the very beginning, there are so many terms that are actually used in this context. I think this is a, one area where you've got psychiatric disorder, mental disorder, mental health, psych, mental health problem, um, you know, mental health distress. So all those things actually means more or less the same thing. In, but mm -hmm. I think the distress angle is a lower uh, context and in the illness is when you actually go into a stage whereby you are unable to function um, uh, in, in your own family life, or socially, or within the employment setting. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that in the cultural South Asian culture, I mean, we'll go on to that in a, in a short while. That you know, it's an issue that w we need to be more open about as well. And uh, so, so in, in your um, um, introduction uh, paragraph, you had said. So, so why, why do you think that almost 23% of the total burden of health problems in the UK is attributable to mental disorders? Um, and what can we do to, to reverse it? Well, the 23% is actually based on the economic analysis in terms of the days lost, um, in terms of quality of life, etc., that people experience. So, um, in a, um, it, even though uh, it, it looks at uh, you know, uh, how we should be trying to organize better services for people, it also reflects uh, the, the, the inequalities in services, uh, how people are not actually accessing services, absenteeism in work as a result of those things. All those actually things, actually, all those things count um, in, in terms of this 23% um, of, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, of the health burden that we should experience. So, for example, in terms of uh, all the Ill, major illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and all those things, there are psychological in, uh, consequences to that as well. Mm -hmm. and I think there are um, you know, mental health issues experienced by all those people um, with um, physical, um, the so called physical um, health uh, problems. Mm -hmm. So, we need to try and um, explore all those things in, in the wider context and um, not just look at the physical illness mode alone. We need to look at the mental health impact, the mental health consequences or some of those major diseases and disorders that we have in our society today. Um, but also in terms of um, the, the, the mental health, mental illness angle um, and uh, adequate services for people, adequate support for people, um, and the opportunity for people to explore the diversity of services that, uh, that, that might be beneficial for them. But at the moment, there isn't that diversity of services to a certain extent. There, is a, there, is a, there are a few shops, um, and, and we have to be satisfied with those shops. If you are not happy, happy with, those, that, uh, with those shops, then there is nowhere else that we can actually go in the current uh, healthcare context of, of the, 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 the NHS. Mm. Um, and I think that can be an issue um, for some of the people from diverse cultural communities um, mm -hmm. because uh, they think that they are not actually listening to us, um, it might not be appropriate for me, or there could be the whole stigma angle of uh, I don't want to talk to those people because I don't want anybody else to know about us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that goes on to what we were saying before about the community not um, um, yeah. acknowledging uh, particularly mental health issues, but also in general um, it, within the South Asian community, um, it, there is a, um, a gap in, in um, sort of um, campaigning to get the services that we need 
tailored towards our cultural needs. Um, and without that voice, yeah. there is a general view that um, we lose out. And, uh, you know, unless we are able to articulate or question or campaign, um, you know, we, we're at risk of uh, having worse um, health outcomes. And then when you look at the COVID situation right now, I mean, obviously, it's very, very topical. You couldn't get more topical than the current yeah. situation, particularly in Leicester. So, um, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a difficult area. And, and I think we do now need to address it uh, somehow. Um, so do you think economic, that... It's an economic issue an economic issue of how we actually improve the mental health of, of the population. Only 13% of the NHS uh, budget is actually devoted towards mental health. But even though all other, uh, you know, um, uh, that are the mental health issues actually affects everybody, but it is not actually looked at from the holistic perspective. So mm -hmm. and I think we have major inequalities um, in, in, in mental health for all people not just the minority population, but all for all people mm -hmm. uh, problems in actually accessing services, getting the right kind of support when they actually require that. And, and also in terms of the choice of, of, of support mechanisms that they would like to see. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether there are any figures. I mean, if it is uh, economics that determines mental wellness, shall we say, uh, the level of, um, is there a disparity between the 13% that's spent on mental health within the, the BME communities? Is there a, sorry, BAME communities? Um, you know, are, are we receiving the, the same level of support? Or is there a, is it, I suppose what I'm asking is, is there a higher incidence percentage-wise for the population that we have? Is there anything that you can say? I mean, I know this is probably from the top of your head, but something the, that needs to look at. The incidents are um, maybe similar in, in relation to the rest of the population. Um, but mm -hmm. I think the issue is actually as to how people are not actually reporting that matter, how mm -hmm. they are not actually seeking the help when, when it is actually required. Mm -hmm. um, from the, especially from the, you know, from the South Asian perspective, and I mm -hmm. think people don't talk about mental illness, people don't talk about mental health, uh, people don't talk about mental distress. So, and the city is actually hidden away. And then mm -hmm. when we have problems, um, and I think it is actually, uh, we try and ignore it altogether, the family ignores it altogether, and um, then think that, you know, it will go away. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you wait on it and wait on it and it becomes a crisis. And that is when people then tend to wish to go and uh, get admitted um, uh, on, on a legal section to mental health hospital settings or other, other, mm -hmm. other services here. So till that time, nobody would have known about these uh, issues. Um, they might have known, but they think they ignore it um, and they don't report to a GP, they don't go and see a GP. Um, they don't make any private appointment to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So it is it's an important um, uh, context here. And mm -hmm. stigma is also a major factor uh, in terms of uh, within the South Asian context, really, because um, the negativity uh, and, and the self-blame that we manage to think that in you know, a mental illness, uh, you should be you know, in a weak family, you're a weak individual. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if you have especially women or girls in the family, how would we actually get married off? Uh, because of the mm -hmm. fact that Somebody with mental illness in the family. So there are all major issues. And I think people then tend to hide away. And, and a stigma is a major, major factor here. Mm. And they don't seek help because of the stigma. And they so, don't talk about it because of the stigma. Mm. So do you, how, how do you think we could we can address this um this sort of um uh gap in um coming forward? Um, whether it's because of stigma, but how do you create this conversation within the Asian community, do you think? You know, as a, as a professional who knows the, right. both the sides, how, how can you... Yeah, yeah. I think that too, there are so many different angles here. First of all, I think people might be thinking that um, they are not able to access the existing uh, mental health services by the NHS or in the voluntary sector sometimes. 
um, because they think that people don't understand them. Um, and, and going to see a psychiatrist might be particularly a problematic issue because of the fact that they might think that, you know, well, how do I actually divulge all my problems to a strange person? So this mm -hmm. you know, I can't talk about it and I don't want to talk about it. And would they understand my real issues or the family issues or whatever? And what actually happens if, you know, if somebody else hears about my problems, then what would be my chances in the community as a result of it? Mm -hmm. So I think my what is my planning in the community as a result of it? So I think there are the, those factors that need to be addressed um, alongside it. Because it is not just a, here is a service, you know, go and actually approach the service, go and talk to somebody about it. And GPs, um, you, you know, most some most of the people do tend to actually go and see the GP um, and say they are down or they have uh, physical ailments, especially within the South Asian women tend to actually more report more uh, somatic symptoms or physical illness symptoms as opposed to saying that I'm feeling very down, I'm feeling very depressed. Oh, I feel very anxious. That is not the first word. He said that, you know, I have tummy ache or I have shoulder pain and I've been having it for a long time. So mm -hmm. somatic complaint actually comes up first. And mm -hmm. the question is, um, a GP sometimes might actually detect it, sometimes might not actually detect it because it is actually a five minute, 10 minute consultation process. Mm -hmm. and sometimes people are actually given medication um, in, in a, to, you know, go, take some anxiolytics, take some antidepressants, and it might actually get better. Um, so, you know, really the, you know, on one hand, we are actually medicalizing mental health as it could be when with an issue of some, you know, what, uh, some distress issues. But there is no point in actually medicalizing distress issue. What we need to be doing is actually trying to um, educate um, the masses in relation to what are those mental health issues. How can we create that um, mental health literacy in the community? How can we have a conversation around mental health? Mm. Um, that's where some of the voluntary sector agencies actually come in. Because they are, so most of the um, uh, people with mental health issues from, from South Asian communities that I meet uh, from time to time, um, they always tell me about the good stories around, around um, um, meet, meeting with the voluntary sector um, help, helpers, really. Because they understand the culture, they understand uh, their family issues, and they are actually able to give them a very kind of tailor-made approach as to what kind of services might be helpful for you and what is it that you need to do and, and, and take them through that process. So there is some holding your hand in, in, in those settings as opposed to somebody going to an NHS that you're on your own, you go there and then you report all those things and you come up with this baggage and you take all this medicine or you take you go and see somebody. So there is that dating game and then there is the, the medication game and then there's all this anxiety bubbling up in you and the thing that, you know, what is going to happen to me? But as mm -hmm. another context, you have a friend, you have mm -hmm. somebody to help you. Um, and I think that is very reassuring for, for many people. Not just in the South Asian community and also in the Black um, African community, it's the same thing as well in terms of having a friend to support them through through that process. So people find that extremely useful because then, and I think um, the the stigma sometimes it can be evaporates in that kind of context because they're able to talk openly about it mm -hmm. because they understand the culture, they understand the religion, they understand the belief systems, etc. So. In that kind of context, I think it would be useful to try and enable some of the voluntary sectors to promote that through uh, link worker schemes um, and, and other, other ways that uh, people can actually either um, access them first and then through that um, to, the, to the health services. Because some of the things we go and see faith healers um, mm -hmm. and faith healing or um, you know, uh, some kind of religious practices might actually help. Mm -hmm. uh, here to judge the process, it might it might very well indeed do that. Um, but I think that there's also a way in which the faith healers can also guide uh, people into the health service. There's things that they could do and things the health service could do. I think that sometimes that actually happens in Leicester too. That's um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. there is a pathway uh, in terms of how mm -hmm. um, thing could be um, combined, a kind of combined service really, including mm -hmm. the patient and the NGOs and, and, and other agencies could all help one person to mm. go through that process and, and kind of um, and, and promote that recovery. Mm. Mm. So the thing is that you might still have the symptoms. You might still, you might still feel quite down. Uh, you might still feel quite depressed. You may need to take medication as a result of it. Um, and and, and that, um, you might always have that. 
But that doesn't mean to say that you can't have a family life. That doesn't mean to say that you can't work. That doesn't mean to say that you can't go and, and study. So recovery is not about uh, the stopping of all mental health symptoms that, that you actually kind of looking upon as the so-called normal person. Recovery is about how one can function even with the symptoms uh, and to try and carry on a normal life as possible with those symptoms. I think majority of people tend to do that. Um, apart from the people with severe mental illness who are actually unable to, uh, who might not be uh, able to do that. Mm. And I, go, I suppose that there is that little disconnect between um, people's perception of what could happen if they went to the authority, the NHS kind of thing, and, and become part of their statistic and not having the control over their, their health. Um, and in so doing, not going to them, um, they may go to other sources, but yes. in the meantime, they create a, a worse situation for themselves when they do then end up with needing more intense support uh, and, and then be out of control in, to a degree with the medication and whatever. But I, I like the idea of what you said about um, sort of community leaders or community act, uh, you know, uh, friends being able to be in a position to actually be the friend first, not the gatekeeper, but the friend who yes. then uh, enables more of this uh, conversation to happen, really. Uh, which, which yes. uh, you know. But whilst you were talking, it just reminded me that on the 31st of July, we will have one of the, um, um, organize, well, two organizations, the South Asian Health Action and the other project that they're both um, very active in Leicester, certainly. Um, and we can hear more about that on the 31st. Not that I'm putting a plug on that right now. Yeah. I think Leicester, yeah, Leicester mm -hmm. has got, um, and I think an important concept in the Leicester pit. I mean, obviously, the population is very diverse 50%, nearly 50% of the people from diverse, multi, uh, diverse ethnic communities. And mm -hmm. yet, we have very little in relation to the expression of mental health, how people uh, are actually dealing with mental health issues within the South, especially, for example, in today's context, in the South Asian community. There is very little um, um, uh, uh, in the narratives about it. There are very little in terms of services, how services are actually trying to actually help uh, within that context. Uh, or, and uh, what kind of um, help, um, both within the you know the, the NHS mode of help or other kinds of help, what would be helpful in those in in in, in our in our uh, community? There isn't much written about it. There isn't much of an awareness of it. We mm. still um, prescribe to the traditional modes of psychiatry, which I'm not actually saying that it, it is it is a it is a workable model. But I think it might not be a workable model for everybody. Um, mm. So I think we have. To then try and look at cultural adaptations of things to some of those individuals. Mm. And I think how many people are actually uh, accessing help, especially many South Asian women may not actually be able to seek help, including men as well. Some of them may not actually be able to seek help. So we have very little information about that in our own um, front garden, so to say, in terms of mm. our own services. Um, but I think we could be leading the way in, in terms of creating these are the kind of things that helps. This is the knowledge that we know in, in, in Luster. So there is that big gap. Um, and I think, and, and, and that is what I've been trying to do for the last few years that I've been in Luster, to try and create that critical mass of narratives or knowledge or conversations with people so that um, together we can um, build up that uh, awareness and knowledge and services um, for the community. That's fantastic. I think that's uh, that's so needed. Um, and yeah, Leicester could lead the way, I, I believe, uh, in, in improving the lot of, um, you know, communities that have been disadvantaged in the past kind of thing. So do you think that there, there needs to be a mental health uh, education sort of process within schools to encourage people to talk more freely about, you know, like you said, um, it doesn't mean that your stresses and stra uh, anxieties and, and depression and whatever, they won't all necessarily go away, but it doesn't mean that they have to go away. You can function in life without needing support services. So if we are teaching children to 
develop a, a sense of awareness, like you say, self-awareness of their mental wealth, shall we call it, then, then there's more chance that they will know when to actually approach uh, the services. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think they would be. But I think um, from, from uh, an adult service perspective, you know, from a grown-up perspective, really, um, I think there has to be more conversations, more dialogue about mental health and, and what is mental health and what is mental ill health. And I think NHS has a clear role in, in trying to guide that conversation. It is not just about prescription of medication uh, and psychiatric appointments. And I think that is the kind of latest stage. There should be the kind of mental health promotion exercises. And I think NHS has recently completed a study looking at um, access to mental health services by diverse cultural communities in Leicester. And I think that clearly identifies the lack of um, that, that joined up services around me. And, and how uh, you know voluntary sector and NHS can come together and, and try and provide that kind of uh, first um, uh, kind of service um, in terms of information um, and perhaps GP services can actually try and help as well in terms of mm. having somebody there to mm. uh, you know, talk about mental health or something about mental health. Um, mm. It should be from a positive perspective. Mental health mm. is not something negative. Um, I think you can recover from that. You can carry on. And I think people think that that is not possible. And I think it is to try and eradicate that, 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 that negativity, that misinformation people might actually hold. In fact, that eradicating that stigma around mental mm. health. The more we see about it, the more people actually, people with mental health um, or mental health issues from our own community talking about um, how they have actually um, come through that process, what has actually helped, what has not actually helped, and what are the best ways of actually moving forward. If we have clear examples of that, the so-called lived experiences of people, then I think it gives us uh, a good platform to try and see how those communications, how those conversations uh, could be held. Mm. Uh, I think, um, and, and um, the uh, uh, faith centers, um, temples, mosques, and churches, have a clear role to play because uh, a lot of people do actually seek um, belief system, help from belief systems or faith healers, etc. And I think they could also provide the right kind of information for people rather than trying to um, hide the process or trying to think about that this is a negative thing that has to be dealt with in a different way at all. So mm -hmm. together, um, there could be some commonality of approaches in terms of dialogues that should actually happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Mental health first day is often actually and it's Sorry. about we, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Um, so I was, uh, you actually answered the, the part of the next question that I was going to ask, which was, um, you know, um, religious leaders being able to help the process. I mean, whilst you were talking, I, I just felt like, you know, we, we should come to a point where we can talk about mental health and mental wellness or mental ill health or whatever, in the same way as we talk about diabetes, to say that, you know, uh, I have diabetes. It's not a stigma. It's not, you know, uh, it, it's part of the process of life in some form, you know, um, and and to work work within the community to first remove those um, those misconceptions and then actually deal with the issues that we have. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let me just think. Yeah. I had a few questions that I had written down. Um, so yeah, we cultural beliefs shape the way people identify stress. And the way in which we seek help, um, I think you've answered it to a degree. Um, but could you, yeah? I mean, can you give us any examples so the audience listening can understand? Um, so, what what cultural beliefs are you aware of that perhaps you know need to be um, broken down or um, understood better within the communities? Or, or do you have any examples? 
Yeah, I think the cultural beliefs I and mean, the cultural beliefs um, is important for the person because the culture shapes the way you think. So in terms of how we actually express our um, issues, our problems, uh, not just mental health, how we report um, illness more, both physical and mental uh, perspectives, it very much shapes up the way how we, our belief systems are. Uh, mm-hmm. and uh, our education uh, and, and how the family context actually looks upon us, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think it is important that we um, have examples of those things uh, as to how a person from South Asian community, how they have uh, seen somebody um, with mental illness and how is it that they've actually helped them um, and uh, what kind of helps um, might be useful for them. So for example, somebody with anxiety, and obviously then uh, you have gone to see a GP, and GP may actually have prescribed certain forms of medication, um, but that alone might be sufficient. They need to actually talk to, they need the right kind of support from the family to, to, to get through that process. They need to help out, um, from, from maybe an ex- a friend of theirs or an external an agency to try and uh, help them to try and get a a broader outlook of where am I and, and what are my options and, and how can I actually try and get more help and support to create that self-awareness. And I think that self-awareness actually helps um, in the sense that, that I, I can see improvement in myself. I can see that, that other people are actually listening to me. Other people are there to help me, not just trying to be uh, uh, not, not against me. They're actually with me in, in this process. That, that, that is a kind of dialogue that we should be creating in Sabah. Because the problem is actually currently with the stigma, we actually see this as totally a negative thing. Uh, and the moment we think that, uh, you know, I have mental illness, talk about it in the same way as I have diabetes, cancer, or heart disease. Um, I know recently we have had this public um, awareness campaign with the prims and other people, the footballers, and everybody trying to talk about that, how they have actually experienced, etc. That may have actually helped to some extent. But what about the ordinary person? What yeah. about the ordinary people? I think we need more stories from ordinary people so that mm-hmm. others can actually connect to it. Um, mm-hmm. Because um, you know, somebody managed to say, oh, they are quite wealthy and they can talk about it and they get the right kind of support. What about mm-hmm. somebody, you know, uh, somebody, a real shop owner or somebody who is actually doing a day to day and other, other work patterns, etc.? And I think mm-hmm. we need to have stories from them. How is how is it that has actually helped them? Both the traditional health services um, and also the NGO kind of support uh, and the family and how the employers may have actually helped. Mm. Because they have a clear role here that how they actually support when somebody is actually ill uh, in terms of taking time off or getting the right kind of support from them, etc. Mm. That is talked about because the moment you actually think you you feel that you're you know that you can't cope anymore then you might think that what my I might be sacked from my job and and, 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 and all those kind of things and that actually gives us more worries and that becomes a crisis point whereas if we go and talk to the employer first and then I think you know there could be an adequate support mechanisms could be built around that individual and most mm-hmm. employers can't really do that and and statutory uh, rules actually governs them to actually do that uh, under the current um, uh, acts anyway, um, in terms of uh, you know the rights of uh, people uh, to work in, in all contexts. So I think those things should be looked at. Mm. And the family members have to have a major role to play in all the way through. In the same way as we support somebody with cancer or diabetes, somebody with mental illness, rather than trying to say that, oh, you know, you're not good or you're not, you're not actually doing um, things, you're not actually recovering. That is not the language that we should be saying. Mm-hmm. We should be providing kindness. We should be providing that love and support in all way possible, regardless of the behavior of the person. Sometimes a person with mental illness might be quite distressed and maybe quite um, showing many anger and anger related behaviors or might not be talking to somebody at all. But we should actually have that unconditional love and support, regardless of what. Um, yes. That's what human nature is all about. It is not about uh, dishing down tablets. It is not about dishing down medication alone. We should have a clear role to play. But there are other pathways, uh, human support, um, you know, family support, uh, and other kinds of activities, engagement, um, you know, leisure, hobbies, etc. Um, we know that a lot of things such as um, arts, engagement in arts, 
um, uh, music, uh, drama, or anything, uh, any, anything at all. Engaging that in those kind of things has immense, um, uh, you know, creates an improvement in, in self awareness, self esteem, uh, and and improves that recovery process. Mm-hmm. And some of the recovery colleges um, that we have in the NHS also aims to do that uh, in, in in terms of getting through that uh, that that creating that awareness. Mm-hmm. And also, Support is also uh, something that is not very well talked about. People with mental illness supporting other people with mental illness. Mm-hmm. So you know, people have recovered from that process. And I think that brings in much a stronger dimension uh, of trying to identify uh, with the individual and, and to create a real body system whereby mm-hmm. that person can help uh, them to see you know, um, uh, uh, where they're going, even if you just hold their hand and listening to them, mm-hmm. uh, trying to understand them. One of the most important things is actually trying to provide the support in a non-judgmental way. Mm. I think we really have to hear the person's story and only advise if they actually seek that advice, whereas bombarding them that this is what you should be doing, this is what you should be doing, is not actually going to help in this moment. Mm. And I think that's where some of the voluntary sectors have been very helpful here because they just lose them and they just only provide the support when the person actually asks for the support. Mm. That's right. Uh, that, some, of, some of what you've just said, I mean, peer support, you know, uh, one person with issues helping the other is a, perf- a wonderful idea. There's music to my ears because, in a way, the Celebrate Our Similarities is about getting the community to talk about issues and that, how can we, from a grassroots level, improve uh, our humanity and how we can learn to be kind, you know, teach kids to be kind to each other and and build that mental wealth that we were talking about before. So, no, I mean, maybe perhaps in the future, with Leicester being such a um, diverse city, we, we, you know, part of our work is to do with uh, research, I think it says over there. So perhaps not formal research, but connect the community with a a semi kind of um, approach where we, you know, enable the discussion to start at least. So... Thank you for that. That was really good. Um, but, so, but may, I also, may I also just say that diversity is a strength. Diversity brings in a range of practices. Um, in the current health service, we only look at one model, but that alone is not sufficient here. Diversity has got immense strength in building people's capacities, capabilities, and, and, and bringing themselves into that process. And I think we, it should be health is all about enabling somebody to grow. Uh, and I think it is the agency only facilitates that process mm. as opposed to try to contain it in that way. At the mm. moment, mental health services actually work in a form of containment, not mm. in terms of growth-based services. We can only promote mental health literacy and mental health in the broadest sense if the services actually have that growth angle in it. Absolutely, totally. I think um, the current climate perhaps provides that um, platform, maybe. I sincerely hope it does, because at the end of the day, I mean, if, if in my personal opinion, I'm not trying to make a statement here, but I think if COVID has taught us anything, we really are all in it together now. <laughs> and you really, you know, and maybe the, the uh, powers that be are listening to, to make change happen. And it is needed, you know, it's been, it's been there uh, for a long time. But anyway, uh, get off my soapbox there. (laughs) Um, So can you tell me a little bit about uh, your projects in India? Well, yeah, we have um, have been working on a few projects in India. Um, The current project that we have is something called um, Mental Health Literacy in in Urban and Rural Communities in Kerala, uh, called the Me Help, uh, Me Help India project. Mm -hmm. Um, It is about uh, creating that literacy through drama, um, through arts, uh, films, uh, and other channels. So we, uh, in, in the rural community, tribal community, and urban communities um, in, in Kerala. So you might actually ask, why, why in Kerala? Because Kerala is, is, is kind of a clear example in the Indian context, where a state whereby uh, high uh, investment in health services, uh, because the uh, human health index of Keralans are pretty high in par with the, in par with the rest. 
However, uh, the, there's a higher incidence of mental illness. About 14% of people in Kerala experience mental illness. Uh, and about 12% of people in Kerala uh, are at suicidal risk, which is double the national average of India. So says the National, um, the, uh, national Mental Health Survey of India in 2017 uh, states all those things. So then we thought that it might be useful for us to actually try and um, explore this mental health literacy as a concept. Um, but by which is actually providing, uh, uh, you know, engaging with people because it should be community driven, not a top down, um, you know, uh, psychiatrist or a psychologist saying that um, you are a mental ill, you know, so I you to come and see me. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a kind of very deficit model of service. Uh, it is time that we move to a more of a strength based model of individuals. We have the capacity, we have the capability to grow into that process. We can, we have that strength, we have that awareness, um, but it's how we can actually help individuals and uh, people can actually engage uh, in a conversations um, around an issue uh, in their own family um, and how the family members might have actually helped. And we, uh, we have done um, uh, the first, um, uh, first phase of the project whereby we have collected about, we talked about 200 odd um, uh, people um, in, in various localities in Kerala, both urban, tribal, and uh, rural communities, uh, and, and, and they get a kind of uh, stories from them about their illness and, and the family, how the family supports them, uh, and how the community actually might be able to support you towards them. And you made pieces of theaters from that mm -hmm. um, stories. And then theater back to those people, back to the same community. And to try and get their reactions from that process, and and so the people enabling people to talk, uh, and that's the first phase of actually in terms of um, mental health literacy, um, and enabling them to understand. Oh, you know, I have had this. I have seen somebody like that, uh, and I have had somebody in my family who has done that, and this is what we have actually done. And it gives us a kind of a, a platform for people to talk openly about those things. Mm. So that is what we did in this phase. Obviously. We are slightly delayed because of the COVID context. Um, we, were, we were trying to do major uh, plays depicting the, uh, the mental health literacy angle and films, etc. That is slightly delayed at the moment, but we are, mm. we are, we are through that process. There's mm. another interesting project that we also did in India is about um, resilience. Because you know, internal migration in India, internal migrants in India has been really a in the current COVID context, people have left homes and, and, and they've been working, uh, they've been walking uh, hundreds of miles from, from the slum dwelling community, especially uh, in, into their own states, etc. Um, and I think in everybody kind of um, looks at the slum dwelling community in a very negative sense. Um, and, and I think our, our angle has been looking at how do they actually construct resilience um, in the midst of adversity? Because there are, it is not just the mental health. You know, if you go and talk, if you if you say that you want to talk about mental health, they might not be able to. Um, they, they might say they have to go away. They don't want to talk to you about mental health. But mm -hmm. we wanted to know how they constructed their resilience in the midst of adversities. There are issues in terms of family. There are issues in terms of poverty. There are issues in relation to income. There are issues in terms of basic necessities of water, food, mm -hmm. everything else, etc. And also public health services. But we have. You know, we spoke to quite a, quite a, you know, quite a number of families, about 30 or 40 families. You can see um, you know, the beautiful ways as to how the inner capacities and how they have constructed that resilience, uh, despite uh, having nothing. Uh, and, and they are still mentally strong. And they are actually, because they haven't, got the, they haven't got the time to worry about Facebook or Twitter or other things. Mm -hmm. It is food, water, shelter, and and. Mm. And I think so. It is important. So they are, and and, it, and, and some of those narratives are are, are wonderful and they're, they're so beautiful and wonderful in the sense that it shows that money is not that matters. Mm. It is how we construct that ourselves. And mm. I think having that inner capability, enabling to create that inner capability, helping people push to overcome some of those things. Sometimes services are actually trying to bombard individuals, you know, provide all those things, or provide all those things, provide all those things. Yeah, but do we require all of them? Or can we, uh, can we have some of it that would actually enable us to grow? And I think that's what resilience is all about. It is not a matter of, because I think a few years ago, we are, all the mental health services around the country in the UK have been trying to relabel them as resilient services. But that is not what I'm trying to talk about. 
resilience mm-hmm. is the capacities of individuals to withstand that stress and strain and trying to get through that process. I, and I think people from poor backgrounds and from low socioeconomic strata have already done that. And I think we must start speaking to them. And I think perhaps they should be examples. They should be ambassadors of creating better mental health than footballers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. I mean, whilst you were talking, I was thinking about some of the priorities that we've got for COS. And somebody on our uh, sort of uh, in the back back studio room has just given me a question, which I would have loved to ask anyway. Uh, they're saying uh, mental wellness is also about internal peace. Now, that's a very, very special subject close to my heart anyway. Um, but what are, the, what are the ways that we can practice, um, you know, it? In, other than in in faith terms, so internal peace. You know, you're talking about self awareness and you know all of those good qualities that we already have inside of us. And it's a question of bringing them out rather than bombarding our brains with so much mental stress that we forget about those things. And when you say about the uh, the people in in um, very few um, material wealth are sure. actually quite happy in their environment happier than some people that have everything that they want you know like all the gadgets and everything else so in a way you just answered that question to say that um you yes, know yes. people yeah. have that within them and it's a question yeah. of helping them to come come back to them I and mean, that's one of the things that we do have a priority you know, within that project and i'd love to discuss more with you about that as well um there's sure. another question which i'm not sure what or how how um um somebody's put one here um uh, what wh- why does why does extreme weather affect mental health sorry it says why does extreme weather affect mental health not too sure. When, Maybe they it, can clarify. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, extreme weather in terms of weather, or I don't think it's what the climate mental health. Um, <laughs> I mean, yes, but in the climate um, mental health, obviously, there is, there is an issue in, in terms of the climate mm-hmm. because there are uh, issues about people going having more mental distress in, 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 the, oh. in, the, cold, uh, um, in the cold weather, climate, when winter comes, etc. But I mm-hmm. think just I go back to the point where I actually made in, in terms of how we can actually construct this mental health um, and how can we be the well-being and resilience. Because really. mm-hmm. I think we all have that strength within us. It's how we practice some of those things. And that's where, uh, you know, education might actually help. Schools, and I think, right, having, um, uh, you know, have mental health support, having awareness of mental health in schools, so that children are actually able to try and construct that resilience. Mm. Um, and again, again, I talked about um, you know substance abuse, abuse, etc. That it actually affects uh, mental health badly. Uh, and I, I think he's creating the awareness, also trying to understand more about uh, a, you know the the, the how, creating that awareness of of, of um, uh, the uh, the problems is connected with uh, substance abuse, etc. So I think um, from from a young, a young young people perspective, schools um, need to still have clearly have to have a mental health curriculum. We are trying to work with that in the current context in terms of what schools are for that process. Um, but I think from from and I think it is the, because most of the mental illness actually forms when 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 somebody is actually quite young. So it is very important that support is actually given in, in, at, at, at a younger young age. <laughs> And as I think children, um, pressure, especially within the South Asian community, in terms of the pressure that is actually not just here, maybe not that much here, perhaps more in India, in terms of the education pressures put on young people and children, etc. And they are not able to cope with those things and, and hence anxiety and hence uh, medication for anxiety and depression at very at, at a very young age. Um, mm. But I think creating uh, that hey, having to talk about it and, and how can I talk about it? How can I actually seek help? How can I talk to my teacher? And how does the teacher understand about the mental health issues? And I think it is trying to connect that within the school setting is important. But from a growing perspective, there are a number of things that we can actually do. You know, we have to have a social network, we have to have a social life, um, and we have to uh, exercises, walking, um, and other things would actually help. Yoga. 
great way of actually doing that because even though it is just a physical posture, it actually enables sponsors to create that inner awareness uh, automatically in creates that process. Uh, and many of the belief systems um, in spirituality uh, might actually help individuals to create that um, that awareness within themselves and also connect with uh, uh, other other uh, other and uh, other people um, and, and talk about more about the issues that they experience and try and find solutions uh, by themselves um, and in, in this context. So I think society has a wider role to play here and in, in people mm -hmm. are questions about stigma. Society has a role to play in the sense that, um, you know, it, it has to be providing a very supportive uh, uh, environment for the individual, both in terms of the environment, the physical environment, uh, and also the spaces that we actually have, parks, um, you know, leisure centers, and all those things that are actually all, um, you know, all those things that are actually all uh, in terms of mental health and well-being. Having a swim is an excellent uh, mode of uh, creating that you know, energy and that well-being and that awareness, etc. So the number of examples, the number of things that we can actually do in our daily life. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think people, I tend to worry about people trying to cry out on their Facebook, on their Twitter accounts in terms of how mentally disturbed they are. Um, mm -hmm. right? so, um, but I think, but I think it's just trying, taking a step back. And, and trying to, one of the simple ways that uh, I tend to do or my, when I'm, um, is actually if I feel very, um, uh, you know, uh, uptight or anxious about it, I tend to write about what is it actually that is worrying? What is it that, uh, you know, what you list all those things and then you try and um, read through them uh, and, and then you can then try and prioritize. So what is it that you need to address? What is it that will go away uh, in the next time? Um, uh, and, and, and things that you should be working on. So keeping it done uh, is actually an extremely beneficial and helpful way of monitoring our own thoughts and emotions and behaviors. And it automatically gives us the immediate feedback. You don't notice, you don't need to go and see somebody else for that. So mm -hmm. we can keep that ourselves. And perhaps that could also be an effective tool whereby we can actually talk to a friend with that, or even a, even a, even a psychiatrist or a psychologist in relation to taking these things. Um, and this is what I've actually experienced, etc. So that is an effective tool um, that, we, that we help us to reflect um, mm. on our own thought patterns, our own behaviors, and mm. how is it that we can overcome that? That's right. I mean, you've answered part of the question that I've got on here. Uh, how, how, with the uncertainties at the moment, how can students uh, keep their mental wellness strong? And, and so you said, you know, keeping diaries, actually being active, walking, and keeping it in perspective uh, is is very very topical right now. Um, there was a there was a point at which you mentioned something, and I was going to say um, I think I think we've okay. covered most of the issues, and unless um, there are further questions, I'm not too sure. But I just wanted to mention okay. something that I was interested in that you you did a um, mental health international mental health symposium a few years ago that that um, uh, I was a bit too late to find out about but as part of this project we we want to do a symposium on this wellness and peace actually personal peace and the idea of inner strength and inner self self-awareness and whatever perhaps you can help us in achieiving our ambition uh, sure, sometime sure, yeah. after yeah. covid you know subject to covid allowing us to do something like yeah. that that would be good. So I, I believe that um, I think we we um, I have covered all the uh, questions. I think. What, yeah, what Can I go back to the question about the students, um, the advice for the students in the long run, if that is yeah. okay? Yes, please. please. Um, I think it's important that um, from the students' perspective, because they don't know. Um, and I have uh, I have a young person. I have two young people at home. Um, you know, one, one out of school and one university, and the universities are closed down, and then they are all here. Um, so I think it is uncertainty. What's going to actually happen um, next? Um, but uh, um, you know, especially in school context, you know, whether the schools would actually open, whether I should actually have the right kind of learning, and am I actually able to learn? Uh, what about the kind of online learning? Stuff. Is it is it uh, okay for me, or it is not actually okay for me? Um, and teachers might actually have the same thing, and but that actually how do I actually support individuals in the best possible way, etc. This is something that we can't help. 
It is not our own making. And I think it's important that for us to try and detach ourselves from that. It is, it is because, of the, uh, because of the COVID context at the moment. It mm. is not none of the schools making, teachers making, not any of our own making. Mm-hmm. So we still have time to detach ourselves from that. And it's, I think we, we will be getting through this process. We have to get through this process mm. somehow. So I think we have to understand that, that there should be light uh, at the end of the tunnel. We mm. can get through it. Be positive about those things. And the, some of the things that I've actually said earlier on in terms of keeping diaries and talking to friends and keeping your social network still alive through um, uh, WhatsApp and other things and, and telephone conversations, et cetera, uh, would be extremely helpful in, the, in this context. So anxieties are there. We are all anxious in terms of what is actually currently happening in terms of the, in the uh, because of what we are not actually able to do because of the restrictions uh, around us. Um, mm-hmm. But we are all in it together. So obviously, but Absolutely. we have to, we can, we can get through it. We will be getting through it. So having that belief, having that confidence is very important. Mm-hmm. Well, um, that that leads me to well, in your just your comment to say we are all in it together, uh, and we have come to the exactly five o'clock, which is our time. Time is up. I would very much like to thank you, Professor Raghavan, for your um, really insightful discussion today. Um, thank you for for being kind with me and the questions that I was able to ask you as well. And uh, I would just like to thank the people in the back office, actually. Um, Sandra, thank you very much. Uh, people uh, listening can't see you, but uh, uh, certainly I would like to make a special thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Indrani Lahiri, who's uh, hiding behind there. Uh, you can't get away. <laughs> and James, too, as well. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, I hope to see you all next week. And uh, on the 31st of July, we will be doing more on this subject um, on mental health and well-being as well. But of course, uh, Mana Wutsa, uh is on next Friday, 4 to 5 p.m. and Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. And we look forward to uh, you joining us again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kamala. Thank you. Thank you.